Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You are on to the Agribusiness Chat with Junior Jai, and today we'll be discussing the Ibiscus Flower Value Chain. And we have um, Mr. Shalom Bako with us today, and he will be sharing um, his wealth of, I mean, from his wealth of knowledge about um, Ibiscus Value Chain. Good evening, Shalom. Please um, introduce yourself. Well, good day. <laughs> Currently, um, it's morning time for me. So, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, and like you just said, I'm Shalom Baku, and um, and you know I'll be giving my share from my experience in the hibiscus value chain and uh, in the world of hibiscus. All right, thank you very much. So you farm and trade um, hibiscus flower as well as other um, commodities, right? So can you run us through its um, value chain from upstream to downstream, that is from production, sourcing, cleaning, warehousing, transportation, and then at the end of the day, exportation? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, to start with the, the hibiscus value chain, very similar to you know, the value chain of uh, several other agricultural commodities in the sense sure. that, you know, we always start with the farming. Uh, you know, there's always some aggregating, some processing, depending on, you know, the, what point in the value chain. So, you know, ultimately with uh, hibiscus, you know, the end of that value chain is, is often in some form of production. Or manufacturing. Um, however, you know, you start off farming. Hibiscus is not a very complicated flower to farm. Um, so, you know, as long as you have good fertile soil, um, you know, it grows. It can grow pretty well. A lot. A lot of people don't really farm it commercially. A lot of times, in in places like Nigeria, you find that uh, it's farmed alongside other other crops or, or more just like a, a fence at least you know growing up in northern Nigeria that's kind of how uh, it's always been used by a lot of farmers not enough people that uh, used to farm it's really commercial quantity sort of just mm -hmm. stuff so anyways you know you started the farm um, and then you get into some harvesting Harvesting is quite uh, interesting with uh, at least the variety of hibiscus flower that we farm, mm -hmm. you know, uh, can have some challenges, you know. Uh, it's a beautiful flower. It grows nicely, richly. And uh, Nigeria, not only do we use the flower, we also use the leaves, right? Okay. So this is great. It's, it's used for soup. So it's a great resource for soup. Um, so even the flower, you know, especially the white one, there's different varieties of hibiscus. Different varieties of colors, yeah. Uh, you know, the white one, even down south in Nigeria, um, what's the name of the soup? They, it's called, uh, well, they make soup out of it. We, we do as well. Yeah. It could be used for purpose, you know, as tea, as soup. So after farming, after harvesting, um, the flower itself, can be used immediately, right? Immediately for the soup or for tea. Uh, the leaves can be used as well for, for the soup, like I said, and the flour for the tea. So um, it, it has quite an immediate use. You, know, you can take it and use it immediately into some of these things. And so these are the things that we use it for locally in most mm -hmm. African countries and, uh, and Caribbean countries. Um, however, further down, there, there's, you know, there's a lot more you can do with the value chain than just stopping there, All right? Uh, with the viscous, the cleaning process is not anything complicated, right? Mm -hmm. you, know, you have a sieve or you have a process of just cleaning out impurities, it's, it's quite ready to use. Uh, so... It's not too complicated there. Um, however, you can take it steps further. You know, you can you can do hibiscus and, and process it into, into powder, right? Mm -hmm. Liquids. Um, and so these are some of the things that 
we do for the as far as our value chain yeah. in terms of um, uh, turning it from just the flower use of just the mm -hmm. use to producing into powder, into into liquid, into syrup. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are things that we do further down, you know, the 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 chain in terms of processing, mm -hmm. added value. And then from there, package mm -hmm. uh, filling. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even the warehousing process is not quite difficult. You do have to dry mm -hmm. the flowers. And depending on how you're drying, you might need a lot of space to sun dry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are some sun dry uh, machines that we have in, um, in uh, I wouldn't even call them, they're, they're just air dry machines, but covered mm -hmm. so that you know, dust and other impurities don't come in, but it allows it to dry quite quite cleanly. And, you know, so these are some of the things that you can kind of do in terms of just the drying process. And then, you know, you can you can ch turn them into powder. Let me show you. So this is powder. This is hibiscus powder. Oh, okay. All right. right. So, you know. That's for tea, uh, right? Yeah, it could be used for tea. Uh, or Zobo drink. Exactly. That's what's popularly known as in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes by Bisap, another kind of African Bisap, country. Yes. Yeah. In Mexico, it goes as Flor de Jamaica. In okay. Jamaica, it's known as Sorel. So you have you have you know several parts of the globe. Mm -hmm. You know, especially in African diasporas that mm -hmm. um, consume hibiscus, regardless of the name. Everybody still drinks it and consumes it the same way. So for me, from the flowers, which I don't have any of here, you know, with hibiscus, you know, we, we try to explore what other uses we can have. And one of those ways has been powder, and syrup, uh, has been drinks. We have uh, our, our calyx drinks. Um, mm -hmm. it's now, you know, we're trying to increase our production uh, on the continent. So that's something we're kind of, and initially we started doing our production in, in, uh, in the UK. You know? okay. uh, so by the time you get to the cleaning of the flowers, right? Uh, mm -hmm. when, um, something like adding value uh, yeah. other than supporting the flowers, which is where we need to get to uh, as a continent, uh, especially in Nigeria, but um, essentially, you know, we try to add value before exporting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, exporting is another, you know, step in the value chain where you have to export to, depending on where in the world, will determine mm -hmm. timelines and, and all that. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, then from exporting. You know, if, you, if you're exporting a finished good or finished product, right, it's quite different from exporting the raw material in terms of where that, that chain stops, mm -hmm. right? So if you're exporting a finished material, it can go from there straight to a retailer, you know? However, okay. if, uh, if it's still a raw material, then it's going from you as an exporter to a producer or a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. If you do locally, uh, then you, you kind of skip out of those steps and get more direct to the, the end buyer. Yeah. Uh, and, and ultimately, that's the goal you want to get to in this in this value chain. So, you know, uh, exporting the flowers uh, mm -hmm. as often goes to some kind of manufacturer or distributor, and, and from the distributor, they're either uh, reselling it in that form or mm -hmm. doing some kind of value to okay. increase the value of the product before selling it to, you know, the end buyer, yeah. some kind of store or, or some kind of retail outlet. So. Mm -hmm. That, in a nutshell, is kind of the, the value chain that uh, I've experienced and that I go through mm -hmm. from farm to 
the the empire, or at least yeah. that I've over the years. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. I mean, that was um, a well broken down um, explanation. Okay, so from what you've said, um, I have two questions. Number one, um, what are the complexities um, attached to or that you encounter in the process of making it into tea? That's number one. And um, secondly, I know you have clients in Mexico. How have you been able to manage um, exporting or selling um, um, hibiscus flour to Mexico, considering um, the issue around um, methyl bromide? Great question. Uh, so the, the first part of the question, uh, specifically the complexities around making it uh, into tea, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So for us, the, the, there are some local, you know, uh, uh, manufacturers, if you will. Okay. Right. There are some local manufacturers who have been able to, you know, make uh, uh, the product in, at least take it and put them into tea bags mm -hmm. and things like that. What I've found a lot from local production is uh, a, a lot of people are not actually doing the powder, right? Uh, and putting them in tea bags, it's, it's a lot of the loose sure. flour, just more of the crushed flour. Um, for me, uh, the future of teas will, will have to be in this form. Okay. All right. Um, so in terms of production of tea, we haven't done a ton uh, okay. with, with what we've done so far, right? With the samples we've done so far, for me, my next step is more focused on the actual perfecting the actual production of the powder. Okay, all right. So a final enough process, uh, a, a consistency, and also into into the packaging. I mean, for me, I'm I'm taking it kind of step by step. Exactly. Retailers are uh, consumer packaged goods are ultimately the end goal. However, you know, at this stage, we're more focused on you know, our, our, our processing, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's syrup, whether it's powder, you know, getting that down, you know, quite packed before we jump into packaged goods. However, you know, based on what's out there, based on buyers who, you know, based on the, the, the manufacturers that need mm -hmm. these flowers and using these flowers, based on the teas that we've seen, you know, we, we can definitely compete is our product ultimately is the product that's inside right yeah. everything else is more of the packaging we can get it yeah. out and, and and branding and all that so um to me i'm not i'm not rushing at all on it exactly and actually that's the way it should be one step at a time that's how you win at the end of the day right right yeah so and uh the second part to mm -hmm. your question uh, so, you know, Mexico has gotten a lot of light over the years uh, with, with hibiscus. I think part of it is that, you know, it's, it's a lot more in the media now. Um, and I guess it's, it's a type of conversation that I talk about specifically, but Mexico is not the only country, you know, where, where we have buyers. Uh, Mexico happens to be the largest market for the Nigerian hibiscus specific, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's kind of why it's, it's taking that light. But, you know, um, customers, well, there's customers all over the world, man. Um, and that is something that, you know, trying to focus on more because you don't want to just rely on one country and, and, and exactly. then something happens yeah. like what happened with Mexico. And then you're, you know, then you, you're caught struggling, you mm -hmm. know, or... You have a situation where you have a pandemic and, and you know, so you have to diversify and that's exactly. something that uh, everybody's been learning. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, you know, diversification has always been uh, something I believe in, right? So currently with Mexico, um, does it, I mean, you can, 
those issues have been solved, right? Those issues have been solved. So, however, there, there's a whole process to it, right? Okay. Uh, and, and which, rightfully so, there's a process to exporting anywhere, uh, any Perfect. country, regardless of where it is. So, it's just about meeting the 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 terms and conditions and the, the export processes, yeah. specifications that are required to, to ship there. Um, and for me, Latin America is a space, not just Mexico. Um, I believe in Latin America. Um, and so I've spent a lot of my time in terms of uh, whether it's research, development, marketing, um, and even just office location-wise, just business-wise. I've done a lot more business in North and Latin America and therefore understand, you know, the kind of how to navigate that space uh, a lot better. And I've just found that our agricultural commodities, you know, do well within that, within this market. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, yeah, we observed uh, um, because we just um, started this um, program in, in in February, right? And then the essence of it was not, I mean, majorly for Nigerians at first, but we got to realize that, look, we have to, I mean, we needed to hold the hands of um, other African youths across mm -hmm. the world or all over the world. So we're going to be using, the, my next question is, quite general, but not absolutely, but we're going to be using Nigerian context. I mean, Nigeria as a context, but then it's, it's still going to be of value to other African, I mean, Africans right. what we, um, that are going to be watching this um, interview. So um, if a young Nigerian wants to set up a, I mean, an Abiscus farm, what does this person need to do? I mean, how much land does he or she need to purchase? Or is it even advisable to buy land, should the person go into a lease agreement and then grow from there? Or should the person even just go into learning how to export and then exporting rather than starting from um, production level? What do you think? Well, uh, great, great, great uh, question though. You know, one of the things I've realized, you know, speaking more, sharing more, mm. um, and even still learning more because I, I learn mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Business. So um, I get a lot more of these questions, right? Like, how do I start? Mm -hmm. Someone's like, you know, this guy's exporting, he's, he's in Nigeria, you know? And that's the importance of understanding this value chain, you know? Yeah. Regardless of what country, regardless of where you are, um, whether in the diaspora or on the continent. And so, a lot of times, what, what I've been preaching, what I'm, what I've been uh, uh, teaching, is the idea of this value chain, understanding the different points, right? Or at least just having an idea of understanding that there is a value chain, and then understanding where you fit in within there, right? So, a young man or woman wants to get into agri business. Right. And so this is what I've been developing with my agribusiness guy and this agribusiness course that I'm doing. It's just to kind of teach from, from, from my perspective you know, these things that I believe, which are first understand this value chain. If you want to be the farmer, be the farmer, right? If you want to be the exporter, be the exporter. Not everybody can do several things in the value chain. Yeah. And even exactly. if you do want to do it, you have to start somewhere. You understand? Exactly. I didn't start as a hibiscus farmer. That was not where I started. So if you want to start as a farmer, one, let's start there because production wise, a lot of people who are on the continent, we have opportunity, we have land. Hibiscus is one that uh, it's not a complicated crop, like I said, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a complicated crop. Uh, two, land wise, I can't tell you, hey, go buy one hectare of land. One, different resources. Everybody has different resources available to them. Financially, it might not make sense for you to go buy the land, right? Uh, it might make more sense for you to lease it. Mm. Or, be, be, or, or develop your own outdoor your resources. If you're able to pull together 
five farmers, 10 farmers, 100 farmers, whatever you're able to manage, perhaps they're doing the farming because maybe they have the land or they have the ability to do the farming. Maybe you like the physical labor of the doing the farming. Maybe then that's what you do. But my point is understanding that we have different skills, different opportunities, different resources, but everybody's able to do something. So exactly. even if you're in the village, maybe you have the land, maybe you have the skill set to do the farming. So, um, but oftentimes we're, we're just too caught up in the money area, right? The financials. Exactly. So somebody that farmer exactly. wants to export it to get the value. But exactly. the reality is the reality is this, right? The farmer, right? Even if you want to start today. The, the, the amount of farming you have to do to get export quantity. quantity. You know? Right. So now you're going to think about how much land you have to get to get that quantity. You know, so that's not the, the reality of I was working on. Like I said, you just have to start somewhere. So, you know, for me, I would say it's advisable to me to say uh, uh, depends on the reality of the resources and uh, what you to commit to. So if you want to be the farmer, start off small. No matter what it is you're farming, start off small. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Start off small, get an idea of the crop. There's only so much I can tell you about yeah. the reality, you know. So it's, yeah. uh, for me, I would just say start off small. Start off, start off with what you have, you know. Yeah. Start with what you have, even if it's... Uh, uh, 10 by 10, 100 by 100, whatever. Start off small, get to know the crop a bit, um, and, and to, to be quite honest, develop a relationship with, with exactly. what the land the crop. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and so, you know, once you, once you get and start there, you'll know if you have any excitement to, to go bigger, you know, maybe mm-hmm. get a bigger plot. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And so that's what I would advise. Yeah. All right. So um, you've been in the industry for quite um, a number of years. So could you share with us some of your experiences where you got your fingers burnt? Because I know <laughs> there must be there yeah. must be at least two or three experiences, but just share one or two with us. So so I mean, so we cool down to, to enable us to learn from it. You know, that's that's just the reality of business, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you've been in business long enough, if you've been in any relationship long enough, you know, you, you go through things uh, exactly. that, you know, uh, should strengthen you and develop you as you go. So I would say, you know, those are some of the things that have been mistakes I've made, you know, whether it's things from, uh, man, if, I, if I'm to go way back, back, everything from how you register your company, you know, to yeah. how to, uh, say, I mean, there's, there's quite a lot to, to run business, right? But specifically, I'd say in this business of trade, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about agricultural trade now, but I've been doing both digital and uh, digital trade and, and actual mm-hmm you know, physical trade for, for some time. Mm. So um, trade, international trade specifically, which is what I do and focus on, right, uh, is, is, is I, I appreciate the time I've actually put into it because okay. it's so much that um, you, you can go get an MBA uh, and still wouldn't really give you the real life Exactly. Certain, exactly. Certain, ex- certain experiences. The reality is different. Right. So things from yeah. foreign exchange, because that's mm-hmm. something you have to deal with international trade, uh, logistics, mm-hmm. you know, ship product getting stuck, product getting stolen. Um, uh, I mean, uh, products that end up broken. Or, uh, uh, I mean, so many different things. But um, one thing 
and realize it's like going through every single one of those things is what kind of earns you your stripes. Exactly. You know, it's what earns you your stripes and it's what, uh, it's what you learn from, you know. So for me, I'm speaking from a place of like, I didn't go to school for this. I've just been working over time and learning from each and every experience, you know. Okay. I'm, I've had situations where, you know, products almost didn't get delivered or you know, the logistical nightmares sometimes, you know, of, of you know, moving product from, from northern Nigeria to any port or any other country or any West African country. I mean, so many things happen on the road. Security, insecurity, mm-hmm. however you want to put it. Uh, but, you know, one thing I, I pride myself is on is like, you know, I get the job done. And so that's, that's uh, that, that attitude and that mentality has been what has helped me push through certain situations that, you know, uh, traditionally, I think most people would just quit or give up on. Um, however, you know, uh, I've pushed through every nightmare, every burn, and uh, that's 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 what I, I still, even if more were to come, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and at a certain point, you have to start expecting these things. They in business they call risk, right? Exactly. So how do you mitigate yeah. your risk? You know, because these these things are a reality in in business. So how do you mitigate those risks? And that's kind of what I have learned more and have been learning more to do is how do I prepare for any of these what used to be surprises? Mm-hmm. You know, how do I prepare for some of these uh, some of these things? How do you prepare for a pandemic? Uh, how do you prepare for the Suez Canal? You know, how do you, how do you exactly. prepare for these things and you know, at the end of the day, uh, most customers just want what they what they want. So, um, you know, part of part of doing this business is it's just the international aspect that makes it, uh, or at least gives it this idea of being a lot more grand. But mm-hmm. uh, you know, overall. Let's say they've, they've all taught me good lessons. Mm. Right. Good lessons. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I guess that's the reality of life. Thank you very much. Okay, so, um, I mean, you just left Nigeria, right? You've been in Nigeria for, I mean, you came visiting and um, you're back to base, clearly. So no, I don't. I don't visit Nigeria. That's my home. <laughs> I, I, more, I like that. More, exactly. I like visiting, that. I'm visiting my uh, my office here. In, okay. In the okay. Well, right. but West Africa is my home. Fantastic. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah. I appreciate that. Okay. So what? I mean, what motivates you, or what encourages you to continue to invest in Nigeria? In West Africa, I mean, in Africa at large, considering a reality that a lot of youth, even people people who are way beyond the youth um, age bracket, I mean, they are, I mean, we have a lot of people go, I mean, living the continent or living Nigeria, but you still, I mean, you're still trying to even grow your business bigger in Nigeria. So, what's your motivation for that? <laughs> um, for me. It was always it was always Africa first. Mm-hmm. Uh, born that way, raised that way. Mm-hmm. I, I, whether I came to the states or not, uh, it, that was always the number one place for me. Right. Uh, so coming or going anywhere, mm-hmm. going. Going to the to the United States was not. I can tell you from from the first shoot from the first week or for the from the first month, I was out of the states. 
I was always looking forward to the day I would go back. Um, and over time, that, that was reaffirmed and I became a lot more confident in that. But, you know, I always had that uh, patriotism right, and pride. Uh, and so when, when, when I came to the States, yeah, there's certain things, you know, that, uh, not certain things, there's, there's a lot of things that the United States has far more advanced than several countries in our, on our continent, mm-hmm. right? Uh, however, for me, you know, I've always seen that as opportunity, right? The opportunity to, to see and learn and then take that back to help develop my continent. So I've always viewed it that way. As soon as I, I was done with uh, um, college mm-hmm. and, you know, I, I, I was already playing and doing uh, stuff here in the States. I was playing professional soccer, um, but I was doing well, but I, I left there. I, I knew that I wanted to, I got into finance and banking, you know, um, probably a, a year after my university. But shortly after that, based on how I was doing at the bank, based on just, uh, uh, conversations I was having and, and what I was working on, you know, while I was at the bank, I was working on it on the side, you know, during the night, I was, I was always doing that. So uh, it just came to a point where I was like, I, I need to, I need to go back. I need to cover this. So 2010 mm-hmm. was when I decided to do that. In 2010 was when I, you know, decided, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to go back. I'm going to move back. And this, was for you know a few weeks, about five weeks or so, and then I came back to the states and man, I I learned a lot in that five weeks, yeah. you know. But then coming back, I was like, okay, time to re-strategize, time to get it together, and then put together more things, you know. Uh, uh, I was using the money I was making from jobs and side hustles to, to this vision and dream of going back. Mm-hmm. Right, that's what I was consistently doing. But it was always Africa first for me. It was always to go back to to West Africa and do something like yeah. you know. A lot of people are seeing it now, but I was born seeing it. To me, uh, yeah. I've never been any other way. And mm-hmm. you know, uh, a lot of people that have grown up with me, you know. I, I grew up you know, from Abuja to Jos to Bochi to Grenada. I've always been this way in terms of... Fantastic. Nice one. Thank you very much for that. So, um, I mean, my last question for you. Um, what what um, sort of advice do you have for Nigerian youth? Or uh, yeah, well, advice or words of encouragement? Me too, me too, I consider myself Nigerian youth. <laughs> you know? Um, so what question? Man, piece of advice. When we're we're in a very interesting and critical time, you know, we're in a very interesting time because we have technology that you know, obviously we didn't have several years ago. Um, we have population in terms of numbers, and. No matter how you put it, every single day, every single second we spend here even talking, time is moving forward. Exactly. So what is the future going to look like for all these people that are going to be in the majority? So we need to start, look, my biggest, we need to take it upon ourselves. Like waiting for anybody to come and say is not solution to me. True. We need to take it upon my ourselves. I chose to come back. Mm. Right? Nobody forced me to come back to know You know, but we need to put it upon ourselves to take charge, learn a skill. Like we're in the time mm. and day. Look, I learned something. I try to learn something every day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You understand? People have data on their phones. 
you, if you can browse Instagram, you can you can go to YouTube, learn a skill, and if you look at a lot of things that I've been doing. Is to look, I'm I'm giving it to you. You're not having to pay for this. It's free information. If you're really interested, right here it is. Because uh, for me, I, I don't, I don't, I, I just hope. And my piece of advice is that we should not be a part of um, a future society where people are without skills and not taking not taking ownership mm. for themselves like we have to do that mm. right in order to ask for good leadership right mm-hmm. we need to start training for good leadership exactly if you believe you your lead, look leadership is not an easy thing mm-hmm. you would say it and throw it around like it's a it's not an easy thing Right, you have to have self discipline, self motivation. There's there's a lot of like, so we need to take charge on ourselves. Learn a skill. Mm-hmm. The information is out there. Learn a skill. Add value to yourself. Just like we're talking about adding value to to crops and anything. Crops, Add value yeah. to yourself. Now is the greatest time to do that. You know, um, you have several people, people like myself. Companies that are intentionally, you know, um, intentionally looking to to employ on the continent and build and develop mm. more on the continent. And, you know, even if it's business you're into, look, learn. Learn from this, this Vusi. I, I learned from Vusi. He's in South Africa. He's yeah, South Africa. VT, yeah. Know, yeah. But guess what? That's like a mentor to me. From mm-hmm. afar, mm-hmm. you know. So these things are available to to become better at, you know, we're, we're having these discussions, right? Where you, if you, anybody's listening to this, get free information. Look how to get started, or any mm-hmm. advice. And this is free information. You're not having to pay for exactly. it, um, yeah. which is a beautiful thing. So if you can learn, but ultimately, all that matters is the action, implementation. Exactly. So, and I think that that's where we have a lot of downfall. So I would just encourage a lot of you to, you know, let's talk. We, that's all that matters is, is the action. Okay? Mm-hmm. Take, take the steps to learn the skill, right? Mm-hmm. And, and trust me, opportunities will find you. As long as you're adding value, they'll, they'll, they'll find you. So um, that would be my piece of advice. All right. To, to, to most of the let's stop waiting for government. Um, government is not uh, the, government is not, yeah. it's not an excuse. Um, yeah. it's it's become too much of an excuse. Let me put it that mm-hmm. way. And, and, you know, um, you also have to prove mm-hmm. to the government or people who are representative of a government as to why they should listen to you. But exactly. they can't just listen to you because you're yelling. And uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. something. I agree. And so what, you got to show them what should be different, mm-hmm. and you got to show why they should listen to you. And mm-hmm. it's becoming inevitable. We're in a time and age where we're not we're not okay with the norms and the status quo. You have people like myself, like yourself, a lot more interest from the diaspora and mm-hmm. on the continent mm-hmm. that want better. And I think yeah. that momentum and um, with action mm-hmm. will definitely change things as we see it in the next five, 10 years. We're going to be talking about a whole different, whole different uh, continent. So mm-hmm. I have huge faith and that goes back to your last question. Like, um, the, the reason why I'm still passionate about the continent mm-hmm. and like I said, I've always been, but I, I just do believe we have the greatest continent on this planet. Exactly. Yeah. And so nobody can take away uh, from that knowledge in terms of mm-hmm. know that. So, of course, I'm going to always be optimistic about the possibilities we have and the opportunities we have on the continent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. 
Thank you very much, Shalom. And um, thank you for your time to come up on, I mean, for this interview. So that oh, would thanks be for having me. Yeah, you're welcome.